So we're going to make a start now. So how this is going to work is uh, we're going to start off with uh, collecting, uh, well, half the questions for one of the speakers, and then I'll come to the other uh, side of the room to, to finish off. So we'll do a speaker at a time and get through, um, hopefully, all of the questions in the time we have available. There is just one thing that we did quickly want to put to all of the speakers. And um, so Chris, in his introductory conversation, uh, introductory presentation earlier, um, spoke about the distinction between uh, kind of mandatory action, so, uh, so government as kind of state-led action, and uh, an action that kind of business and others might take themselves. So I wanted to put the question to all of the speakers. What do you think should be the balance between business and government action on climate change? And Paul, as you've got the mic, shall we start with you? And just very quickly on. <laughs> yeah, sure. <clears throat> well, as with so many things to do with this issue, uh, the answer is both. Uh, business has got an absolutely crucial part to play in this. In fact, if business isn't involved, then it won't happen. But for business to be involved, it's got to be able to make money out of the transition because that's how business works in the society in which we live. And at the moment, some of these things do not make money. Energy efficiency can make money and renewables can make money. But across the transition, certainly if we want to accelerate things, then we need a fundamental shift in, let's call it the tilt of the market playing field, so that it becomes easier to make money out of the lower carbon options than to make money out of the higher carbon options. And government has a crucial role to play in changing that, either through economic instruments, as we call them, or taxes, or trading systems, or whatever it may be, or through regulations. There was a regulation, for example, that said all new buildings from 2016 had to be zero carbon, and that did wonders in the building industry. Those building firms that really wanted to get ahead on the zero carbon side, they put a lot of money into preparing themselves to build zero carbon homes. It then didn't, it then didn't help in 2015 when the new government said, sorry guys, we didn't mean it, because all those investments obviously didn't make the return that the, bill, that the businesses had thought they would. So governments have a crucial responsibility to tilt the playing field in the right way, but also they have a crucial responsibility to be consistent, credible, and not to change their mind. And I'm afraid in the recent past, governments have not excelled in any of those particular adjectives. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Fernanda, same question to you. Okay, so the first thing I want to say to answer that question is that um, I, I don't buy into the view that we need to just make a case for um, businesses and private investors to basically solve a planetary crisis that affects all of us um, only if they're making money out of it. I think the role, but, but there is a role for private companies and private investors um, and private interests to play, of course, because we all have to play a role. Um, I think the role of government as an institution that represents all of us and that has actually an interest beyond money, because government is supposed to be giving us you know, decent um, life standards, um, jobs, um, supporting the balancing the economy so it's resilient, support the natural environment. I mean, those are all roles of government, not of private businesses, because private businesses are obviously interested in making money as they are set up now. So I think the role of government, um, therefore, is in investing in that transition and leading, and leading by example, let's say, so that private um, businesses can then um, understand, and very much to what Paul was saying, the commitment of government as an institution to the transition. That's what's going to give um, businesses the confidence to invest in those things that are necessary to take us there. And that's, th that's one role. The second thing I want to say is just um, the Bank of England, um, because the Bank of England can help that as well. It can help um, businesses and private lenders um, be guided in the right way by um, encouraging them to move money away from fossil fuels 
into um, the industries that we need. And it can also help government lend um, money at cheaper rates and help lower its costs in the long run. Those are all things that we can do if we want to. And the benefits of it are beyond just profits. Um, you know, it is a better quality of life. Um, and it is a more sustainable economy overall. Sorry, Fernando, I'm going to stop you there because we've uh, yeah. got a, quite a few questions to get through. But um, uh, Modi, same question to you, if that's OK. Um, sure. So I think it's a good question. Um, I think there's cer certain public goods that the government has a responsibility to um, protect and provide for everyone in society. So an example is biodiversity. Um, things like nature, we need bees to pollinate um, plants. You can't necessarily make money out of it. And so we need government to kind of set a regulatory framework within which public goods can be protected for everyone and also encourage businesses to, as they make money and invest, to do that in responsible ways. So an example is, um, and this is from a different sector, the soft drink, the sugar tax that we have in the UK. Um, you know, food companies make money out of selling um, sugary drinks and sugar isn't good for people's health. By the government introducing a tax on sugar, um, on the companies that produce sugary drinks, that has encouraged the companies to actually remove the sugar from their products while still, spe still being able to make money, but now they're selling healthier products and people's sugar intakes are coming down. So that's a kind of an example of how the government can come in and create a regulatory environment which encourages businesses to do the right thing whilst protecting the public's health or public goods. Great, thank you very much, Modi. If you hold on to the microphone, so I'm going to come to uh, uh, collect four questions for Modi to begin with. So I'll start with this table. Uh, so if I could have your top question for Modi, please. So Modi, how can we ensure the government follow the recommendations outlined in the three areas that you mentioned earlier in your presentation? Wow, that's Sorry, Modi, I'm going to collect a few at a time, okay. so you might want to uh, jot these down as we go. <laughs> Sorry. Will reducing meat consumption make eating elitist? Will it deny lower income families of certain foodstuffs? Great, thank you to table 13 for that. Uh, come to this table next. Would you promote public transport like free bus fares as an alternative to cars? Thank you, and finally to this table. How can we make nutritious, healthy food cheaper compared to fast food? Did you catch all of those, Modi? I think just about. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. So the first one, and correct me if I'm wrong, is this, how can we get um, um, governments to implement the recommendations um, across the three areas? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, um, yeah, that's a good question. I think... Um, Government is there to um, protect the public um, and the citizens that it's responsible for. But at the same time, what actually makes governments work is them actually feeling and hearing from the citizens that they care about these issues. Um, and so I think there's an important role for like um, us to use our vote as a starting point <laughs> to kind of vote for the politicians who might be supporting the policies that we would like them to um, you know, that support the solutions that are needed. So that's one example. Another important role is for civil society organisations, um, think tanks, community, community groups um, coming together to really advocate to government um, to show that the people care about these issues. Um, so I've spent a lot of my um, working life working for uh, NGOs and often um, when I've been working with civil servants trying to get them to change public health policies, um, they're more likely to listen to these evidence-based recommendations if you can show that parents, um, charities that represent parents are supporting these issues or, or um, you know, or, or school children um, or people who are affected by the conditions that the, the policies might be affecting. So those are just kind of some example, really getting the, the communities to show that they care and the people to show that they care um, making a business case often works as well, showing that the interventions are going to be cost effective, that businesses are still going to be able to thrive um, if the government implements the solutions is another important thing to do, um, and showing the wider benefits to society, in, you know, either in terms of health um, or the environment, also good cases to make. 
Um, so I'd say, yeah, starting with the democratic process right through to making the economic case and showing that people really <coughs> care about these issues, those kinds of things are what makes government um, actually implement recommendations. Um, and then the second one um, is reducing could the recommendations around reducing meat intake be elitist? I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I think at the moment, um, meat is probably too cheap in this country because the amount we pay for meat is subsidised by um, taxpayers' money and there are unintended consequences in terms of uh, impacts on the environment, significant con contributions to greenhouse gas emissions, as well as, as well as huge losses in biodiversity. None of us um, benefit from those changes to um, the planet because we are going to be suffering from the effects of climate change. Um, so we are already actually paying for the unintended consequences of the cheapness of our food um, through the unintended impacts on the environment, but then also unintended impacts on health. Um, so, you know, people working in the food sector will argue that m meat, for instance, needs to made, be made more expensive to reflect the true costs. At the same time, we need to think about what is the impact on people who can't afford to eat meat, and that comes down to the values we desire as a society. Why is it that there's poverty in this country when we're one of the richest countries in the world? We could consider solutions that help to tackle poverty, such as a minimum basic income for people, which might then ensure that everyone is able to at least be able to afford a basic standard of healthy eating. Things like paying in the minimum wage as well. Um, if that was increased to a level that everyone was able to be able to afford healthy food, that could be another solution. Um, and, and so we might have to make ch choices in, in order to fund those kinds of things, we might need to tax um, some of the most wealthy corporations, most um, more wealthy individuals <coughs> in society to create um, the resources, kind of slightly redistribute the resources so that those who have can be able to support those who haven't and everyone benefits from the process. So those are some kind of examples, just thinking about the issues in a kind of more holistic, just way about as a society. Great, we're, just, uh, we're running a little short on time, so just a couple of quick answers to the other two questions, if that's okay. Um, sure, promote public transport. Is, is free public transport a solution? Um, interesting question. Uh, we already pay for public transport, so potentially um, maybe not. Maybe, maybe it's just rebalancing the costs. So if you're booking a, a last-minute train ticket, let's say, to Edinburgh, you're not having to pay... Um, 100 or 150 pounds, if that cost could be capped, that might be a way of doing it. And um, so but for making us pay fair prices rather than really exorbitant or expensive ones might be a solution instead of forcing being forced to fly because it might be more, ex more cheaper to fly. Um, and then the last one was um, making healthy, should we be making healthy food cheaper? Um, as I've said before, I don't think cheap food is the solution. It's, it's part of the problem. And so actually what we should be doing is um, making food, the true cost of food um, reflected in the prices and actually supporting everyone in society um, to be able to make, afford that healthy food. At the moment, those who are least able to afford healthy food are most likely to suffer from the consequences of eating unhealthy food. And that's unfair as well. Great, thank you, Modi. If you pass the mic along to Fernanda, I'm going to collect three questions for Fernanda, starting with this table. Do you think the committees, the forum are reporting back to, have the teeth to push through what is needed, to push through what is needed uh, to the government and the House, through the House of Commons? Great, thank you for that question. I'll come to this table next. Uh, you say uh, we need to invest, but where does the money come from? Who is paying for it? The government um, have to get the money from somewhere. Thank you very much. Into this table. Hello, Fernanda. What's the fairest way to get to net zero? Thank you. So um, I guess fairly pithy answers to those, if um, that's OK. Sorry, the last one is a big question. Um, I'll leave it to last. So, um, can the committee, do the committees have um, the teeth to push through the recommendations um, to government? I think they do. I'm very interested. I, it's. I'm going to kind of share the question with you because I'm very interested on what comes next with this process. Um, 
and you know, and at the same time that this assembly is happening, there's one happening in France, where there has been big statements by uh, Macron, um, the prime prime minister of France, <laughs> president, <laughs> president, sorry, um, to um, basically get the recommendations from the climate assembly there um, into government policies unfiltered. So that's quite a bold, radical statement that, of course, we, I, I don't think we're getting that here. Um, but I think there's a lot of pressure um, overall in society going on. And this year is a really big year for, for the climate debate. We're hosting um, the Conference of Parties on Climate Change at the end of the year, where all member states, uh, sorry, all, all nations from, from the world um, will come and gather and talk about you know, what, is it, what is it that we're doing. So I think our government definitely has um, a mandate to um, push through um, action. Um, and maybe that will help the select committees push the recommendations through. The second question, um, where does the money come from um, and who pays for it? I'm glad you asked that because that's what I didn't have time to <laughs> say um, during my five minutes. Um, so there's a few things and the New Economics Foundation has done some research on it and put a paper out on five ways um, that we think you know already give government quite a lot of um, money to then invest. One is borrowing, um, and I know it can be a controversial conversation about public borrowing, um, but um, borrowing basically means that people living right now and future generations are all in it together, investing in that better future. Like, you know, we, we have to act on climate change. There is no choice of that. It only makes sense that we all um, contributing. Um, but it needs to come through um, public investment. And importantly, where then does the government invest that money? Because where it invests that money will dictate actually how we get the money back. Um, and if we do invest in the right things um, that creates jobs, clean energy, um, and creates all the other benefits that we will get from a cleaner um, economy, um, and, it, and, it, and it distributes that in a fair way, then you know, tax receipts, um, you know, government is getting that money back um, and, and the economy grows stronger, basically. Um, so borrowing is okay. The second thing is, um, sorry, the second thing was valuing the benefits. Um, our economy right now only looks at short-term benefits and that's why we focus on profits, whereas nature restoration, um, you know, you getting an education, um, you, uh, excelling, excelling in, our, in your job, those are long-term benefits that are not measured when we account for costs right now in investment. So we, we, sh we should account for those. Taxing, um, like we tax more labor um, in this country than we tax wealth right now. So that's one way to go about it. We should tax more on wealth because we know wealth is very accumulated. So actually that's quite fair. And also taxing as we go throughout the, tr the transition, um, you know, putting a, a, a tax on polluting industries, you know, that won't obviously disappear overnight, um, but we tax that as we go. Sorry, I have to rush out. Um, the, uh, redirecting dirty subsidies. So I think it was mentioned already earlier today how the UK still um, subsidizes quite a lot of fossil fuel, not only here, but also around the world. So we could very much uh, um, redirect that money into clean energy. And the final one is the Bank of England, which I already mentioned. The Bank of England has a, a role to play. They can basically choose to redirect finance um, in the right direction. The final question, uh, what's the fairest way to get to net zero? In 30 seconds. In 30 <laughs> seconds. Um, so like I said, I mean, we, we, we and many others around the country are trying to answer that question. I say this, but I think the challenge here, it really is on the social justice element because um, government has already committed to um, achieving net zero. So all the policies we have now are going to have to be climate policies. They're gonna have to because climate impacts everything. But these climate policies must also account for um, you know, this, this distributional impact. So, you know, how are we paying for things? You know, it shouldn't be one for all the same. Um, and how actually we are um, 
um, uh, distributing the benefits of that investment as well. Because you, know, you could get a scenario that a lot of private companies invest in nature restoration, invest in cleaner energy, but they are also keeping all the profits and potentially keeping ownership of land and of the resources that we all need and that we all have to share, and that's not fair. So um, I think it's, it's not a quick answer, um, but I think the important thing is that climate policies must also be socially just policies. Great, thank you for that. So we've got about 10 more minutes. So I'm going to collect a few for Paul and then we'll get through as many as we can uh, to, to finish. So if I come to this table next for one for Paul. Um, is there investment in graphene batteries and will there be a success? Okay, thank you for that. I will come to uh, this table next. Are there any alternative ways to measure the economy besides GDP to capture sustainability and well-being? Great, and I'll come to this table again if that's okay. <coughs> um, so in your um, five minutes, you painted a very rosy picture of becoming net zero and the economic benefits, but is this too good to be true? Thanks. So if you could take those three, Paul. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Graphene batteries? I don't know. What, one of the fascinating things about technological innovation is that you never quite know what's going to come through. When I look at the amount of money going into batteries, and when I look at the costs of the various kinds of batteries that look like the major uh, likely winners, I'm absolutely certain that within five years we're going to sort the uh, electricity storage problem out. To some extent we already are. There are utility scale uh, batteries already on the national grid uh, that are being invested in by private actors because it makes sense to do that. Um, there is a huge search for alternative materials. Lithium is not totally unproblematic, as you probably know. And um, graphene may indeed prove to be one of those that comes through. There's uh, plenty of guys working on it, and there's plenty of investment going into it. Um, one of the things with innovation we have to be prepared to tolerate is a bit of failure. Uh, if we don't experiment, if we don't try new things, if we're not ambitious, then we're not going to make the breakthroughs. We had to invest in offshore wind at £150 a megawatt hour in 2005 in order to get the latest investments in offshore wind, which are at £37.50 per megawatt hour in 2000. And 18. But there was no guarantee that was going to work. That was an act of faith, and that was something that government put some money into, but private companies put a lot of money into in order to make that happen. And um, we're going to have to do that across the piece. But if we do it intelligently, uh, I'm absolutely certain that the battery problem is one that's well on the way to being solved. Um, other alternative ways to measure the economy. <laughs> How long have you got? Uh, yes, there are. Um, I actually did my PhD on this, so we can have a nice chat about this afterwards. Um, I, 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 think, I think the first thing to understand is what GDP is, and it was never intended to be a welfare measure. It's a measure of income. It's a measure of national income. Most of us think that national income is quite important. On the other hand, very few of us think that national income is all that matters. So if you're interested in national income, then GDP is a very, very useful number. It's not the same as wealth, and we ought to be measuring wealth. It's not the same as welfare, and we know in our own lives that there are many other sources of welfare which are already measured to some extent, whether we're talking about community cohesion, family life, uh, the state of the environment, the quality of the environment, the fact that the air pollution out there is not great. Uh, all of that affects our welfare. And government has the rather difficult job of balancing all those particular factors through the democratic process that we have. Um, so, yep, there are alternative ways of measuring both the economy and welfare. Uh, government does an imperfect way of doing that, and could, it could certainly be better. Um, and uh, um, I, th I think we are paying more attention to some of these other issues than, than we did. Um, and finally, is this too rosy? 
Well, it's a really, really interesting question, that, because um, if you had told me in 2008 that one megawatt of photovoltaics would cost less than 10% in 10 years' time than they did then, which was the statistic that I gave you, I'd have said, what have you been smoking? Because you'd think, I mean, this is just inconceivable. No one predicted that. No technologists, none of the guys working on that. Um, none of the scientists working on that, and yet it happened. I mean, that actually is it. You want to go out and buy that stuff now, it will cost you less than 10% of what it cost you 10 years ago. <coughs> and we're getting better at understanding how to bring about those processes in the economy. It's called innovation. We know that we have to invest. We know that we have to deploy at scale. You don't get offshore wind at £37.50 by not building it when it's much more expensive. But if you build it when it, it's much more expensive and it's a new technology and you're smart about it, and many of the companies doing this stuff are pretty smart, then you can get those kind of cost reductions. So, yes, I mean, I've looked at the evidence, and I think that's not too rosy. In fact, I think, by and large, we're much too pessimistic about it. By and large, we just talk about the costs of this transition without actually thinking of the new industries, the new technologies, the new jobs, and all that stuff that can go along with it. So I'm keen, in when I'm an advocate as I am today, um, I'm, I'm keen to try, try to write that balance a bit. Great, thank you, Paul. Uh, so we're about to run out of time, but I do want to make sure that every table gets to ask two of their questions, and I think there are still four that haven't yet. So I'm going to come to uh, this table next, and uh, if we could have a question for Fernanda. Not ask one for Fernanda yet. So, Fernanda, you mentioned your work in coastal areas. How can we ensure that a transition reflects the interests of those most affected there and also elsewhere in the country? Okay, so I'm going to collect one per speaker and then we're going to need really quick answers. So, could we have one for Paul? Is that all right? Yes. Can we encourage technological, technological advances from businesses quicker? Okay, if you want to take those two, and then uh, I'm going to come to the other side of the room, so be thinking about... Actually, I'm going to give you the choice of who you ask your question to. Uh, so, Fernanda, do you want to take that really quickly? Um, yes. So, it actually gives me a chance to give a better answer to your question <laughs> about how do you do the... Yours. Um, so, you know, through my work with coastal communities, and also now um, we, we are going to start working um, in regions that are heavily reliant on high carbon jobs in the country as well. Um, and I think it's already happening. I mean, lots of local authorities have called climate emergencies, for example, and they're all trying to figure out what do they do next? How do they actually implement it? And many have taken on board the just transition agenda, you know, and how do you do that in a fair way and that you take people along with you? And I think forums like this, um, you know, we, we're going to need to um, be in the next year, two, three, four, um, testing out new methods of democratic participation. I think that's the first thing, um, you know, and when I talk about policies and climate policies being socially just, I don't mean just government sitting and doing those policies on their own. Um, I think it needs to be a little bit different this time because it's such a big thing that impacts everyone. Um, and so there are forums um, at a local level um, that you know local authorities with community groups and other um, agents can build for that kind of dialogue um, and to propose a plan that works um, to deliver the net zero car target, but also um, social justice. And in the big picture thing, just to say that you know my work on coastal economies just showed how, and it's not just coastal economies in this country. You know the economy, UK economy is heavily. Um, focused in London and surrounding areas, um, which means that investment tends to go more into those areas. So areas around the country that need investment the most are the least attractive to it. And that's not going to change because it hasn't changed throughout decades by us just expecting the market to respond to it because the market is the one that's saying, well, that's, that's not attractive for investment. Where am I going to go there? But if we care about fairness, then we need um, some instrument which the, gov uh, the state and government has to correct that. Um, and that's what I'd like to see anyway. Great, thank you, Fernanda. Um, over to Paul. Um, very quick answer, Paul, because I'm conscious that you're going to be dragged out of this room fairly soon to go up to the other group. Yeah, well, I mean, the very quick answer is yes. Uh, government can do lots to encourage 
these, these technological advances more quickly. First thing is research and development spending. Uh, and it's nice to see in the new government that they're, they're talk, talking a big talk at the moment about spending money on research and development. That's important. Number two is helping the route to market. It's very important. We could double or treble the amount of offshore wind that we're putting into the sea. Um, and we need to do that if we want to power up all our cars and all the other things that we're talking about using zero carbon electricity for. Uh, that's a good investment. And uh, what we're needing are the firm power purchase agreements that the government's po policy mechanisms put in place. <coughs> Private companies will come in and build those things. Uh, all along the East Coast, they're building factories for uh, offshore wind turbines. They can accelerate that process um, much more quickly. But above all, I'll come back to the thing that uh, I said before, that government policy has to be credible, consistent, and coherent. It's no good saying you're going to get zero carbon homes in 2016. That commitment was made in 2008. Uh, uh, and, and they said, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a few years to get there. And then in 2015, you cancel that commitment. Because businesses now don't believe when government says we're going to have zero carbon homes in 2025. And would you believe them if you'd invested large sums of money against the last commitment that was meant to be some years hence? So government has really got to uh, get its act together on that credibility, consistency, and coherence. Uh, and then, absolutely, we can accelerate these technologies, and we'd better do it, because otherwise, net zero is a dream. Thank you, Paul. So, um, just trying to squeeze in two quick questions. So, this table's next. Um, and the question is to Modi. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, Modi. Um, so, the question here is, um, talking about energy-efficient household, do you think benefits of new heating systems will cost less, and that's in context of perhaps introducing a scrappage scheme of value. Is that something being looked at? Great, thank you for that question, and this table. A uh, question for Paul. What are the low carbon practical alternatives to replace gas boilers? So 30 second responses to those, if you're able, um, because the other speakers are coming down. In a word, I don't know. I will say this is not my particular area of expertise as a health expert. I'm around, um, you know, the the, uh, the benefits beyond health of, of um, energy efficient schemes. Um, I'm not sure how a scrappage scheme could work in the in the housing improvement sector unless you're talking about getting um, a reward for trading in your old boiler getting a discount for a new boiler, that would help for sure um, as, a, as an incentive. Um, but th it's, there's still got to be lots of other money that's needed um, or people are going to have to spend to improve their homes. Great, thanks. Modi, over to Paul. Yeah, this is, this is one of the most difficult questions because gas boilers are so great and they're so convenient and they do what we want when we want them to. Um, there are alternatives, but they will take time to install. Uh, heat pumps are an alternative that work on electricity. Uh, and in the transition, we could be talking about hybrid heat pumps that work on electricity for most of the time, but which have uh, a gas alternative. And obviously, they're much lower carbon. They're not zero carbon. But we've got 30 years, and this is why we need 30 years, because you guys with gas boilers, I know, you know, these things last about 15 years. So we've got two generations of investment into these gas boilers. And the first one can be a transitional investment where we go into a hybrid. And then the second one will have to be zero carbon, either heat pump, potentially district heating, uh, using, using a, a, zero carbon, a zero carbon heat source. That for, is good for new estates because it's relatively cheap, uh, but it's difficult in retrofitting old estates. And obviously, most of our buildings will, will be there. It's a tough one. And then, then we might may be moving to, to hydrogen boilers. Those of you who are as old as I am will remember uh, that we used to heat our homes through town gas. And town gas was over half hydrogen. And so we have gas distribution networks that will take hydrogen. We could have hydrogen boilers. But again, that kind of transition is going to take time. And as Chris Stark said right at the beginning of this, where does the hydrogen come from? We've got to make the hydrogen. And there's all sorts of um, technological uh, development and progress that's needed actually to make that a commercial solution. So that's why we need 30 years, because that's a big transition um, and uh, some of the options still need further development. Great. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, so sorry, do we, 
quite get to everybody's question, but can we say a really big thank you uh, to Modi, Fernanda, and Paul? Uh, so you're now needed upstairs for another grilling, and uh, we'll uh, bring the other speakers in, I think, you are.